was born in Paul's Valley, Oklahoma. I was raised in Oklahoma City, Bethany, and then Putnam City, and then Bethany again. I worked up in the forestry service in Idaho from 14 to 21. I came to New York at 23 uh, and took on a place down in Brooklyn for about a year and a half, and then my new Colombian flamenco dancer wife said, I don't want to live here. And I said, why? And I was answered by a black hand reaching in between the Venetian blinds. She said, every time I come in from a shower after dancing, he's there. I went outside and chased the guy down the street and I couldn't catch him because he could run. That's kind of the story of getting here. And then uh, I came to New York, Manhattan. And this place here was owned by Mrs. Reitman, Mary S. Reitman. And she said, uh, Sherrod, I love your work. Put it on the ceiling, put it anywhere you wish. Uh, as long as I'm alive, you will have no trouble with the city. Uh, and then she dies of cancer. So I get a call from her lawyer that tells me I got to leave this area because it's be dezoned from AIR residents. I went to civil court, I won. I, I got a lawyer first. And the trouble with lawyers today is they cost as much or more than the case itself. Then I went to Supreme Court. Uh, I won there with the lawyer. And a lady that was in my class at the Art Students League where I was teaching master painting, she said, I will give you $40,000 to get a good lawyer. So I used her lawyer and he was good because as she said, he's pro-tenant and he owns a place up in New York State. And uh, his family has had it for 150 years, uh, an old farmhouse, and uh, he has enough money to accept whatever you offer him. Well, it ended up that I did pay just as much as had I, <laughs> had I uh, maybe been kicked out and had to move back to Brooklyn. Uh, now, the crowded, zoning position that I'm in has to do with the little guy as a concept in America as an individual trying to fight City Hall. Uh, since I have won both cases within the time period of 10 years, they can't try you twice for the same thing, theoretically, but they're still trying to do it the landlord today is telling them, I don't live here. He's telling the inspectors that. They don't let them in the building. They send my packages instead of to New York City, this address. They send it to Rome, Italy, or they send it to wherever I've been, giving a talk or elsewise. So that's kind of the, the story of my conditional uh, should I say, uh, inhabitant uh, introgressing in reality to trying to take care of the work and ensure it uh, because I received a lifetime award via uh, uh, Artist Achievement Award for a lifetime. And they're starting to have to honor the all, uh, I received in, in 1916, 16 honors from Italy. I have received this year 16 honors from New York. And it's interesting that New York or America, they've copied the architecture of Europe because they didn't have any floor pattern of, of should I say, functional reality and what they call beauty, which is European ex. Explorational dates of uh, 
It's like the Duomo one and two, or the El Greco house uh, in Madrid. Uh, I keep being shuffled, and it interferes with my attempt at any work today. I evidently was born with an Oedipus complex, given via the love she gave to me on every issue. And she was an Aries sign, which shows a certain degree of let's go now, let's go do this immediately. Uh, we're running late for the deadlines. And I've inherited via my second wife, a son that's 43 years old this year, that uh, belatedly always finds a way to escape to another realm of distance, whether it be China, whether it be Japan, whether it be Boston, uh, escaping my concerns of functionality and life. So I'm a man of ill refute, irrepayment. Well, my mother passed away while uh, I was in Rome uh, receiving the pre Roma. And I said, Mom, I'll fly home. She said, they told me I have a month to live or two or three months, max. And uh, it turns out she died within something like three or four weeks. She said, don't fly home, do what you and I believe you are. In Oklahoma, Playing for Oklahoma State University, I had a scholarship, uh, and there was a coach called Henry Hank Iba that was all Irish and loved to boss young men around, showing his superiority of the game. Uh, whether it was true or not, he, he had an opinion about everything. And he said, Sherrod at third base, and I said, but I am, I, I can play third base. I said, but I really want to play center field. And he said, either you play third base or I'm going to take away your scholarship. And I said, what the hell? I said, you're not going to do such a stupid thing. And he said, yes, I will. The next thing I knew, I didn't have a scholarship to, uh, to the state of Oklahoma. A university. Time is God because of this, in my understanding. I don't give it to a higher power. I don't give it to the Big Bang Theory. I believe in God. I come from Oklahoma. That's the Bible Belt. Kansas is the Bible Belt. Texas is the Bible Belt. And, and Kansas always has a beautiful basketball team because they've got men of height. And they've got desperation. They want to belong to the world. Uh, I did not know that prolificness would wipe me out from the world. Nobody wants to come over because there's no space to live, except for four women that have decided to move in all at once. And I am the most prolific man doing poetry, painting, composing, and master teacher and educator of master teacher as a renaissance man, okay? I am the renaissance man. And I find it ridiculous that no one else ever asks any questions of any depth. I mean, when I go to a party, who do I talk to? I talk to the youngest little 13, 14 year old and try to give them counsel beyond puberty into life of being a woman. What does that mean to you? It means that I am really the master teacher and I try to give everyone their space. I don't believe in controlling via the Mexican wall uh, babies from their mothers. Look what it did to my son. Her being Catholic, her being Colombian, it ruined my son's life. She taunted him into dislike.
for her his his father and I don't blame him because I understand how it happened then she tries to come back to me after 17 times of leaving me I got fed up finally I said love does not cover the bill at this point I will no longer allow you to come back to me as a half Colombian. She was from Barranquilla, the pirate coast. And on the pirate coast, they aren't people of Bogota. Meaning that Bogota are more established. They have money, they have houses. Uh, Barranquilla is, take it, it's, it's like New York City, take it before you leave it, it won't be there when you come back. <laughs> it's like a parking spot. When I was in Rome in 1986, I received a phone call from the Vatican that said we would like you to donate a painting uh, for our permanent collection. I thought, well, that's, that's, uh, I will accept that. They said, please come over and give us some advice on the Sistine Chapel. The guy up on the trellis, four foot from the roof of Michelangelo Sistine Chapel, come up here, come up here, I'm up here, I'm up here. I want you to give me advice. I crawl up, stair-stepping up on the work scaffolding he said tell me the truth he said you know we knew we use Japanese uh, paint I said why did you do that he said because it's free <laughs> and I said so and and I said don't you know the Japanese paint they make today is fast it's modernly so fast and so gaudy that you think you're in a Japanese uh, place of the jean or the toilet. It has nothing to do with Michelangelo's slow, the cracking of the wall, the aging of incense and time. And then all of a sudden, 20 feet people begin to bolt in below us. And, and we're looking down on top, and he said, shoo, 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 And I said, what, 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 what do you mean, shoo, shoo? He said, these are the money people. And if they hear us, are you telling me, since I'm the top curator uh, uh, trying to fix the Sistine Chapel, they will fire me. And he said, I won't have a job. So I had to suddenly go into third delivery of 15th voice. And I whispered to him, I said, you run it. You run the fucking ceiling. He said, I know we did, but don't let anybody know. Well, here I am back. This is, it was 1986. Here, that's when I received the Pre Roma. Here I am back. And not only that, in Iran, Gaddafi, the political tyrant of that time, somebody from Iran came over the academic walls of the Pre de Rome building. And I go outside after having a shower, after painting downhill on the Argentine way and coming back, taking a shower, and I suddenly am confronted with two guys with machine guns. And they said, are you he in Italian? And I said, what the fuck, you dumb bastard? And I said, oh, I'm an American intellect. I said, don't accuse me of anything. I said, or I'll get your ass kicked off. I went to the director and I said, they are not to carry their machine guns inside the building. They said, well, how are we going to apprehend the would-be Iranian intrusion? So, so that was the second one. 
I ran into Jack Palance in Madrid, uh, uh, Spain, and Jack came in with his bluster, big cheekbones, and that grin that would, for Shane, was fantastic. I mean, skinny, dressed all in black, the fastest two-gunner at that time, uh, supposedly, they give it to Texas. But this idea is that uh, Jack says, well, I want this and this and this. I said, hold it, hold it, hold it. I said, Jack, I already have bought these. You can't have any of them. He said, well, you're taking the good stuff. I said, well, I'm an intelligent collector. He said, well, what can I collect? I said, this whole pot of nails for your ranch in California. And he looked at me and he says, you're right. He said, I'm losing my mind. I'm going to uptown for my ranch. Then I said to him, and look at that. There's a beautiful thing over there on the wall. That eagle, that looks like it was carved in Mexico. It's got this primitive look of what a real eagle is, which is a killer of any large bird, rabbit, jackrabbits in Texas. And I said, it's certainly USA. It written all over it. The wings had, they had, it had flags. It had the flag of, of, of stripes. And it also had uh, uh, the stars in around the back of the head which proves it was done for this country. Now, who got it and how they got it over there, I don't even care. But the fact is, I said, if you don't buy it, Jack, I will. He said, no, no, I'll take it, I'll take it. He saw, he saw the director telling him how to, to do his acting. The next person that I met of, of notary fame was Salvador Dali because from Brentono's bookstore, I was delivering a book for the old and rare department uh, of George W. Stair, old and rare department. And it was a very expensive book. Uh, and he was in a hotel on 59th Street uh, from Fifth Avenue towards Park on the south side of the street. I go in, suddenly I see Dolly with his mustache all waxed and curled. And uh, I nod at him and I passed, or was gonna pass him by. And he says, young man, young man, I want to talk to you. And I said, for what reason? And he said, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm Salvador Dolly. Uh, I said, yes, and you've done some very beautiful paintings. Uh, and uh, I also said, but I don't want to talk to you, Salvador, because I don't need any of your verbalization and tricks with the camera, like uh, the disembolvement of... Uh, of uh, the beautiful woman at the window. And he said, uh, you like the painting? And I said, I love it. So I walked past Salvador, I delivered the book, I go back to Brentano's, I type out more labels to people of, of uh, on a money list that Brentano's had. Uh, for fine binding gifts that were very expensive. And uh, uh, I'm in the Museum of Modern Art one day with a past friend. His name was Ernesto Pundar, uh, uh, a typical uh, freedom lover for its own sake without a concern maybe of morals beyond the self of survival. And uh, we play pool 
and I do an etching in reverse on copper plates of him beating me something like 21 games I owe uh, Ernesto. Uh, Otto Dix was standing over at the edge of the room, the German master of the unequivocal woman. I have always shied away, even as a young man, because I'm an introvert that has become an extrovert via the gift of the of the city streets of New York and the pressure of of color of mom and pop shops, candy and uh, all the goodies, licorice, maybe things that one should not eat, Dunkin' Donuts. So I can not only paint anywhere, there was, a, there was a, in the west side of the village through the years, and I think this goes back to 1974, that said Sherrod will paint on anything uh, and can paint anything on anything because they saw me cover up, somebody had thrown out a canvas. I've told my son for 10 years so that they can become acquainted with the work, MoMA, the Museum of Modern Art. Uh, the Metropolitan has been down here in 1979 via Nan Rosenthal. Uh, I told him to write a form letter of introduction and show this painting or that painting to them. The Metropolitan responds, Nan Rosenthal and the lady that was to become the director of the Harlem Museum come down. She says, Mr. Gerard, uh, Mr. Chirad, what, what, uh, what do you want us to do? And all of a sudden, we were in the back room, and the lady that became the director of the Harlem Museum panics and starts running all the way to the front, which is about 50 to 70 feet, screaming, I can't take it anymore, I can't take it anymore. And I, I said, you can't take what? You can't take fine art? You never seen any fine art? Uh, you thought you were coming down to see a graffiti-ized uh, master? Well, I am, in a way, the father of graffiti art in the street. Now, the vice president said, he calls me up because he gets my number. He says, how much charade do you want retail for that piece that's in the window? I said, well, being that I'm 28 years old, being that uh, you've asked that question, I want at least a mil and a half retail. He said, well, it's worth it. He said, I want to thank you for that information. I said, do you have a buyer? He said, of course we do, but nobody has wants to buy it yet. I said, you mean it hasn't been posted with your auction house? He said, yes. He said, that's the truth of the letter. And hung up, said goodbye and hung up. Now they've got me caught in between a hard rock and what shall they say, pebbles, of, of, of stuttering Plato or Socrates. I've always been somewhat the wax wing of the sun. I seem to never get any place because everybody says, oh, we love your work, we love your work, but we can't pay that much money. All right, the difference between fine art and again, illustration, what they're doing are the where they stop in the act of painting, I have already gone on. They have no philosophy. They have no real thoughts. They don't really understand the street. I have been out there in that street for 54 years. 
The other was spent in Oklahoma painting telephone lines and poles and painting blackbirds and painting hosting cattle. They don't know anything. That's why they are illustration. An illustration is an idea without any life beyond that. Fine art carries you into the Pope, carries you into the curator at the top of the Sistine Chapel, turning it into Japanese commode. Uh, if you don't know it, you don't have it. Let's look at it that way. Again, DNA, we're all programmed. You're programmed the way you are and what you do. And you're doing a fine job to have found me because I really am a very bashful human being. But when I open my mouth, I do tell the truth. I tell about issues. I don't let triviality dissuade me into some more shallow position of sociality. All graffiti is out there are uneducated, passionate, beautiful people that want to speak but don't have the goods to really speak.